This is not the first time girls have been burned alive in the city. Every week, I must learn of the untimely death of one of my sister workers. And there's solidarity for you, my sister workers. She is herself very much identified with this movement, herself a worker. Every year, thousands of us are maimed. It's true. OSHA didn't exist yet. What is OSHA? Jack? Administration. Yes, Occupational Health and Safety Administration. It's what keeps you safe in dangerous jobs, or should. That is to say, somebody from that department should come in if you're in a textile factory or manufacturing or a steel mill or something like that. They should come in and they do an examination of workplace conditions. Didn't have any of that in this day at all. The life of men and women is so cheap and property is so sacred. There are so many of us for one job, it matters little if 143 are burned to death. We have tried you citizens. What does trying mean here? Sort of like put on trial. To some degree, or tested. tested. Tested, yes, put on trial. We are trying you now, and you have a couple of dollars for the sorrowing mothers and daughters and sisters by way of a charity gift. This is, this is a little bit of a reprehensio. It's a little bit of a rebuttal. What have people done? What, ha what has the public done? They donated some money to the families? Yeah, they, they took up a collection. They took up a collection. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But she's angry because this collection is insufficient. And she views it as a kind of sop, basically. It's unfortunate. But she's saying, you know, this charity is charity, but Every time the workers come out, in the only way they know to protest against conditions which are unbearable, the strong hand of the law is allowed to press down heavily upon us. So this was a time in US labor relations when generally management could call in the police and say, get these workers in line. It happened in strike after strike. It happened in the coal industry. It happened in the strike at uh, at Water Kent Radio, it happened in a strike uh, making automobile manufacturing. The workers are restless, call in the police. There's a famous scene in the movie Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. Has anyone ever seen Modern Times? It's a funny film, it's also very poignant. It's about a guy who works in a factory and his plight. And part of his plight is that the working conditions are terrible and he tries to get relief from them. And all of a sudden, he finds himself outside one time, unaware that right behind him is a huge worker's march. And he just doesn't know it. But the police see him, and he is immediately identified as being the leader of this march because he's walking in front of them. And they come after to arrest him. He was never a leader of the march at all. He didn't even know the protest was going on. But he's going to be fingered, and he's going to be arrested. Well, the strong hand of the law is something that she repeats again in the very next short paragraph. We've been orderly and peaceable. We've been told and warned to be intensely orderly and intensely peaceable. And they have the workhouse just back of all their warnings. What does that mean? They have the workhouse just back of all their warnings. What does that mean? I took it to mean that like the uh, so, like the reason that the police and or that the laws are on the side of the workhouse is that like the employers uh, are may, may might be giving money to lawmakers or something. Well, they might be. That them. might be. But what what is the workhouse? It's like an institution of yeah. the state, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, a, it, the, it, it's it's not run by a private enterprise. It's it's not exactly a prison. But who's put in a workhouse? People who break the law. Yes, or people who cannot, are not gainfully employed, and they are supported by going to the workhouse. Don't forget, this is before Social Security. This is before workers' compensation. This is before unemployment insurance. This is before all of those things. It's before any kind of safety net exists at all. So what are you going to do if you're fired from your job? Yeah, you'll get a worse job, exactly. You'll get a worse job. You'll still work, but it'll be worse even than the bad job you had before. 
That's the threat. That's what it means to have the workhouse at the disposal of, of the law. It says, then she concludes, I can't talk fellowship to you. Now, you, she could have said that at the beginning, because that's in effect what she said in the, in the first sentence. That's in effect what she said. But now she's going to repeat it in this explicitly definite way. I can't talk fellowship to you who are gathered here. Too much blood has been spilled. The only way the working people can save themselves is by a strong working class movement. <coughs> because the law is not going to help, hasn't helped. And the people on the property aren't going to help. They don't particularly want to change things. And the public hasn't helped, at least not yet. Now, it's interesting. This is a speech given out of anger and out of outrage. And is her audience the public to some degree? Yeah, Jack? I mean, is that like a memorial gathering? So yeah, yeah, it's going to be covered by the news media. Yes, I think the audience is to some degree the public. Yeah. And she's not being nice to the public. But who, who is really her audience? The yeah, the working class people. What is she saying? She's saying, let's get a movement going. Now, you know, may not know what it means, but my mother and aunt sure knew what it meant. You open many a men's garment and you see a little label in here and it says ILGWU. Anybody have a clue what that means? You don't see it much anymore because most of the clothes we buy aren't made in this country. ILGWU. International. What gender's involved here? Ladies. What are they making? Garment. Workers. Union. Got it. ILGWU, International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and so many pieces of clothing made in the United States for so long carried that label, and some still do. And what does that tell you? That tells you that that union has been able to secure certain conditions or collective bargaining for the women who made that garment. And they put it in the garments they make basically to tell you that that garment was made under conditions that the people who made it found acceptable. So this is prehistory before the ILGWU. This is the beginning of a labor movement. We'll come back to maybe to Al Smith's speech a, a little later in the class. But let's, let's go to a speech given by John L. Lewis. Turn to page 113. Let's look right at the top of the page. Lewis became head of the United Mine Workers Union. A lot of people were employed in the mines in the United States at this time, many of them. There are not many mine workers left in the United States, although some of the conditions in mines still are dangerous. Several years ago, I think it was 29 people were killed in a mine accident, but there are fewer people working in the mines than used to be. One of the people working in the mines at the time Lewis gave this speech was my grandfather. My grandfather worked in the mines. He was a miner. And when he died, he died of something called black lung. Black lung is when you get a lot of coal dust and particulates in your lungs, and it causes emphysema, and then that causes congestive heart failure, and then you die. At that time, there was no federal insurance program for that at all. And the last time I saw my grandfather, he was in an oxygen tent in a hospital. So he worked in the mines in northeast Pennsylvania in the anthracite mines, and he regarded Lewis as one of the great individuals in the country because Lewis was able to lead the United Mine Workers to get conditions and bargaining power which they had never had in a profession that was very dangerous. If the miners ever went on strike and weren't unionized, what would generally happen? They would be replaced. Yes, they would be replaced. They would be replaced by people who were called, what do, what do we call in the labor union someone who replaces? It's not a nice word. Scabs, Scabs yes. And you know, and some of those people need work too. And sometimes their argument is that the union is asking for too much. But in the old days in mining, if you didn't go to work, um, you'd be replaced. Someone else would do the job. And what, happened, what would happen if you demonstrated? Well, you'd be blacklisted. That might happen. 
But what else? What's a more effective way of teaching someone a lesson? Do you bring in strike breakers and start beating people? Yes, strike breakers. You bring in people who are strike breakers. Strike breakers are not polite. And they usually carry brass knuckles or billy clubs or iron bars. And they come in and they make sure that the demonstration doesn't last very long. They break it up. This happened all the time in mining communities from time to time. Uh, it never happened to my grandfather, but it happened to people he knew. And the mines would very often hire their own police forces and their own strike breakers. And generally, the police would say, well, that's private property. We're not going to go in there. I'll give you a, a bad analogy, but it's, it actually is an analogy. If, if something's going wrong in um, Harvard housing, who's the first to be called? The state police? No, you wouldn't want to call the state police. Who's the first to be called? The Harvard police, yeah. The Harvard police. So they're generally not going to call in the Cambridge police or the state police or somebody else unless things are way out of hand or unless there's some So The Harvard police are going to deal with it. And that's a good thing. So the analogy is that you're in a private institution, you're in private property, you've got a problem, you have a private police force. Now that private police force is empowered to enforce the law in general. And that was the argument of the coal companies. We have our own private police force, they will enforce regulations. So the police generally did not intervene, meaning the police that were public police. It would be the coal police and they would come in. So Lewis says, the United States Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, and similar groups representing industry and financial interests are rendering a disservice to the American people in their attempts to frustrate the organization of labor and in their refusal to accept collective bargaining as one of our economic institutions. That's a long sentence. Is it an enthymeme? You want to give us a full syllogism, Anna, now that you've volunteered that it's an enthymeme? OK. So I'll, I'll help you out. Let's begin. Anyone who attempts to frustrate or the organi organization of labor um, and to and who uh, da, da, da. Yeah, do attempts to frustrate the organization of labor and attempts to accept col collective bargaining um, renders, is, renders a disservice. Renders a disservice. That's the first. What now? What's the minor premise? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers are attempting to frustrate the organization of labor and to accept yes, collective and what's bargaining. Yes, the conclusion then? Therefore. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, are rendering a disservice to the American people. Yes, and now notice that. Rendering a disservice to the American people, not just to the miners or the workers, but to the entire country. And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Associations, these are national organizations. The uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce is still a very powerful organization in the United States. And they often step into policy issues or economic issues. So this is an enthymeme, and it's based on that syllogism that Anna just gave us. And now, Lewis was a fiery orator. I don't know whether you like it or not, but he, he, was, he was a Welshman, and he had these huge, big eyebrows like this. <laughs> yes, he did. He didn't trim them. He was a staunch figure, you know, like this. And he would get up and say, no tin hat brigade of goose-stepping vigilantes or bibble-babbling mob of blackguarding and corporation-paid scoundrels will prevent the onward march of labor. Now, I do not recommend this language in most of the papers you are writing. I don't. However, let us examine this language. Tin hat brigade of goose-stepping vigilantes. What does this suggest? What does that image suggest? Everyone know what a goose step is? No, you don't know what a goose step is? I'll give you a demonstration of a goose step. I have seen it live. I saw it live in East Berlin. 
You've seen it on tapes. What does it suggest to you? It's not a natural way of walking. It's associated with totalitarianism in general, but fascism in particular at this time. Yes. It's not a natural way to walk. You wouldn't want your military to walk that way all the time. But if they're on parade or they're on guard duty, yes. So he's invoking a fascist background by using this language, without a doubt. Bibble babbling mob. Now that's interesting. Because very often, the striking workers themselves were called a mob. But now he's saying that the paid strike breakers themselves are the mob. The table is turned. Blackguarding, what's a blackguard? You can pronounce it blackguard, but it's really blackguard. Who's a blackguard? What kind of person is a blackguard? If someone said to you, oh, don't go out with him, he's a blackguard. If like looking at the corporation paid scoundrels, maybe someone who is like two-faced? Yeah, like, two-faced. Doesn't have good Yes, like, yes, yes. A blackguard is two-faced. A blackguard is not to be trusted. Mm -hmm. A blackguard when it comes to relations between say men and women would be someone who'd tell you one thing and then do another thing. Mm -hmm. Someone you couldn't trust. Exactly. And he, then Lewis goes on to say, in the next paragraph, unionization as opposed to communism, presupposes the relation of employment. Why is that sentence important? Why does he go there? He wants to talk about the labor movement. Why is it important for him to differentiate unionization from communism? Because, by the way, people who unionized were called communists all the time. Don't forget that this is at a period of time when the Soviet Union was becoming increasingly powerful. It, yeah, Philip. Well, I, I think fear of communism starting to spread in the United States in the 1930s? Yes, very much. Red Scare, yes. So Lewis is making the point that as opposed to communism, it presupposes the relation of employment. It is based upon the wage system. And it recognizes fully and unreservedly the institution of private property and the right to investment profits. Beginning of the next paragraph, do those who hatch this foolish cry of communism in the CIO, now CIO here stands for Congress of Industrial Organization. Now, this whole history of labor is not something you need to know in detail, but part of what we're doing in this unit now for the next few classes is we're looking at movements in United States history that changed the United States, the women's movement and the labor movement. Now, for many of you, the labor movement is past history because there aren't all that many people unionized in the United States now. It's a relatively small percentage of the workforce. Well, what is it now? Does anyone economic study here, what is it now, 15% or something like that? It used to be considerably higher. If you go back to the 1950s, say, many workers, and have you noticed all the uh, many battles now that have been recently fought over what is called collective bargaining? Anyone here from Wisconsin? No? Yes? Originally. Huh? Originally. Oh, originally. Well, do you know about the battles in Wisconsin over... Yes, could you, could you just say a word or two about that? I'm not intimately familiar, but Scott Walker is the governor of Wisconsin, very conservative, and he has fought public sector unions on every front. Yes, and particularly he's fought their right to collective bargaining. Right. And it's true that many public unions now do not have a right of collective bargaining. And they do not have the right to go on strike. So if you're a teacher in Florida and you're teaching at Florida State and you think you're getting the short end of the stick over and over and over again, you, you legally cannot go on strike. You're breaking the law. Now, maybe that's a good thing. That's the way it is, though. In other words, you walk out of your job, you're breaking the law. That's just the fact. So there is a tension. There's always this tension between management and labor and the conditions under which one might bargain. And that's a, it was a fight in Wisconsin, it's a fight in other states. Different states deal with it in different ways. 